All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we are in a weird week. Um, we're in uh, Psych Disorders 1. You only have three more weeks, including this week. Psych Disorders 1, Psych Disorders 2, treatment. Done. 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 So we are moving very quickly. So this week happens to be a weird week because we have no school Monday. Praise be. Hashtag bless. And then we have SAT day on Saturday. Nope, I keep saying that, on Wednesday, which means we're not testing until Thursday, which means we have a day less for Psych Disorders 2, which is all of your schizophrenia and all that stuff, so please keep that in mind. So we have a very weird week. Your test is on Thursday. Focus study guide, guide, uh, study guide and outline are due on Thursday. You only have two vocab quizzes this week. One tomorrow, one through 10, and Tuesday, 11 through 20. So please make sure you're paying attention to the change in schedule because it is a little bit different. All right, everyone good? All right, here we go. So early components of, this is just background knowledge, just listen. Mental illness has been around since the dawn of time. The first humans had issues. Today we have people with issues. Every family has uh, has been touched by mental illness. Uh, every family, every person knows someone, has it, uh, has it maybe themselves, and someone you're interacting with a thousand percent has a mental illness of some sort in your life. Okay, so during ancient times, we used to throw people into holes and we used to cut off their heads. Okay, thank God we've got away from that. Okay, in the Middle Ages, you were called a witch if you had any type of uh, mental illness, okay? And so today we have much better understanding. Now, are we perfect in 2020? Hell no, hell no. Um, coming out as having a mental illness still has a negative stigma to it. <laughs> still has a stigma to it in 2020. <laughs> Can someone help my man out who knows what they're doing? Thank you, Emerson. I got it. I'm so proud. It's the same system, I swear. I don't change it. Just throw whatever one he doesn't need away. We'll just walk away. Okay, so psychopathology is the study of abnormal behavior. The study of abnormal ha uh, behavior is literally less than 5% of the population for most components. Now, in 2020, we've seen a much larger diagnosis of mental disorders because we have better education about them and we can appropriately label them. Historically, when people ex do you think autism is a brand new thing? No. However, we finally could diagnose it starting in the 80s and the 90s. However, before then, do you think before the 80s and the 90s there was autistic people? Yes, people just thought they were a little odd, a little touched, were some of the terms we used to refer to them. Now we're able to diagnose them specifically, and we can do things to assess them and help them, which is the biggest component. When we talk about psychological disorders, it's any pattern of behavior that causes people significant distress, causes them to harm others, or harms their ability to function in daily life. So when we talk about psychological disorders, we're talking about how it affects you, how it affects your life, and how it affects other people, and how you are able to carry on with your life. Now, there's also situational disorders as well. For instance, depression. You may, my sister was diagnosed with depression at the age of 15, which is very young to be diagnosed with depression. With that being said, I have never been diagnosed with depression. However, I can go through situational depression. For instance, most people who go through a divorce, right, their marriage is getting dissolved, go through a depression. Depression is a psychological disorder. However, sometimes these psychological disorders will present themselves in situational terms, which means, do I have depression? No, but I do have situational depression, which we can see present itself. 
In other types of disorders, we're going to see situational presentation as well as we get through. So abnormality as we go forward is statistically rare. It deviates from social norms. So when you see, for instance, when you go to Publix, for instance, and you see someone's messing up your bagging, and you're like, what the hell? And then you look over, and you happen to notice it is a kid with Down syndrome. Do you immediately fix yourself and be, pull it together? Yes. Okay? That is deviating from social norms. Some of these types of disorders that we'll talk about, you can physically see. Some you cannot see. So abnormality. So you can do abnormal, you should have statistical, statistically rare and deviant from social norms. You should be filling in that box. Some of you are looking at me like looking at you. What? Statistically rare, right, that's abnormal statistically. Yes. Well, I'm getting there. Abnormal uh, social norm deviance means behavior catches you off guard. For instance, Ladies and gentlemen, if me and Connor start yelling at each other, you think that's kind of weird because why am I fighting with a high schooler? Granted. If I'm standing on a corner by myself and no one's around me and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, does that look strange? Yes. That is a deviant from social norms. I'm allowed to yell at another person and that's not weird. It's eye-catching and people be like, damn, what the hell are they yelling about? However, if I'm standing on a corner screaming and no one's around me, is that make people uncomfortable? Have you ever seen someone talking to themselves really impassionately and you like walk a little faster? Yes. yes, that's deviating from social norms. Okay? When people are not dressed in normal clothes, okay, for instance, they have like 15 shirts on. Okay? Do you notice that? Do you kind of like, hmm, gonna kind of walk a little faster this way? Yes, that's deviating from social norms. Then we have subjective discomfort, which is an emotional stress or emotional pain. Now, subjective discomfort makes us less tolerable of others. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're having, every person in this room has had a complete shit day at some point, correct? Where you literally wake up and the world just, like, ruins everything, correct? Nothing goes right. You stub your toe. You hit your head. Your breakfast is burned. And that's just how your day starts, right? Okay? Subjective discomfort is when you cannot unsee something and cannot move forward. So every, if you're, like, for instance, I'll give you some subjective discomfort right now. I'm miserable <laughs> with this damn pregnancy. It sucks. I'm uncomfortable. My back hurts. I have a migraine. I'm miserable. Because of that, it may make me a little cranky and makes me less tolerant of children. With that being said, that's subjective discomfort. Because I'm having other problems, it then presents itself in other situations. You've been mad at your mother and have lashed out at your friends, yes? And then that's caused more problems. And then you're like, oh my god. And then you have to apologize to your friend, and then your friend is just living on their high horse, and like you're like, oh my god, I didn't mean it like that, I'm sorry, and then it just turns into a thing, yes? Okay, that's subjective discomfort, what? It's the same kind of thing, right, Madison, as displacement, but displacement is a Freudian thing. Subjective discomfort is a clinical thing, which is a little bit different, but it's a nice comparison. Nice. Maladaptive. Maladaptive is very important, and we're going to keep coming back to this over the next three weeks, this week, next week, and our final week for treatment. So if you're going to learn one thing today, it would be maladaptive. Maladaptive is anything that does not allow a person to function within or adapt to the stresses of everyday life. Okay? Maladaptive is how well, adaptive is how well you adjust. Maladaptive is how much you can't do normally. So for instance, if I can't dress myself every morning, that's maladaptive, correct? Because I need someone to help me. That's not helpful. It's a basic requirement. Maladaptive is what a person can't do on their own. And that's what I would write in your application box, is what a person can't do on their own. I will tell you, every once in a while, my sister is actually really good about taking her antidepressants, 
Uh, she takes Zoloft, in case you've seen the commercial. She takes Zoloft every single morning. She's been taking it continually since she was like 19 or 20. She rarely goes off of it, but every once in a while, she tricks herself into thinking she doesn't need her Zoloft anymore. So then she'll stop taking her Zoloft. And then she falls into this terrible, horrible depression. And then it'll take us months to get it back to where she needs to be. And then she'll go a year, two years, three years. I think we've gone maybe like three years without having a huge depressive uh, component. But that's very common amongst people who take medication all the time because they think they don't need it anymore because it's working as effectively and it's very common. It's called a relapse. So anyway, when my sister goes into her depressive states, she stops eating, she stops like bathing, she stops going out, and she literally shuts down. All she does is sleep all day. That's the pinnacle of maladaptive. She won't get dressed, she won't take a shower. She literally just lies in bed. She's not even, like, crying in bed. She just sits there and, like, stares at the ceiling and just cannot function, cannot move. That is maladaptive. No matter how hungry she gets, she won't get out of bed. Even if she's gone a couple of days without eating, she won't eat. Unless someone is there forcing her to eat, she won't eat. And then the moment you stop forcing her to eat is the moment she stops eating. And she just won't help herself. That's the type of maladaptive thing. Because she won't take care of herself when she's going through one of her depressive issues. Okay? And this presents itself in many different ways. But that just happens to be one of them for my sister. So maladaptive is how you can and cannot use. Insanity. I just don't want to deal with it so much. By a lot. Oh, insanity is on your thing. Insanity, which is this definition, which is the one you need. Insanity is used to argue that a mentally ill person should not be held responsible for his or her actions. The insanity defense, actually, um, using topical information. Did you hear a couple weeks ago, uh, a couple months ago, I guess in December, some woman at Mar-a-Lago went through two security checkpoints with her car? and then tried running into Mar-a-Lago while Trump was there. No, you didn't hear that? It's like right during the holidays and stuff like that. Obviously, that's a security concern for the President of the United States, yes. But anyway, she got arrested. No surprise there. Uh, and she was found sane. She was found sane, which means she is going to stand trial for uh, attempting to kill the President. <laughs> That's what she said she was there. She was there to kill the president, which is why she went through two security checkpoints, hurt like six Secret Service agents, all that stuff, trying to get into Mar-a-Lago. With that being said, she's going to uh, stay in trial. I think it starts in like a week or two in South Florida. And she had to go through all of these screenings to see if she was mentally stable or unstable. And if she's mentally unstable, they weren't going to prosecute her in a court of law, they just would have sent her to a mental hospital to get all of her treatment, and she'd be there for the rest of her life. However, she has proven herself stable, which means she knew what she was doing, she wanted to do what she was doing, and just got caught. So now she's going to go and stand for trial, and now um, she will, she's of course going to be found guilty. I mean, she literally said, I am guilty. I'm trying to kill the president. So she's going to be found guilty, so she will spend the rest of her life in jail. Okay, so that's what's happening with that. So insanity, if she was in, found insane, she would be going to a mental institution where she will live the rest of her life um, there. But now she's been found stable to stand trial, which means she's definitely going to be found guilty, which means she's definitely going to jail. There you go. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is what the trend is for the next three weeks. For the next three weeks, we are going to be talking about psychology through bio, uh, biology, cognitive, psychoanalytic, behavioral. We're going to be looking at it through all the perspectives, ladies and gentlemen. Hello? Listen. You'll write it down in a sec. Every time we talk about things, we'll be talking about how different psychologists see it from the different perspectives. We're doing this with all the disorders, and we're doing it with all the treatment. For the next three weeks, all we're talking about is psychology through the eyes of different types of psychologists. Biological psychologists, cognitive psychologists, uh, psychoanalytic, so people who believe in Freud, all of those people, we're going to be looking at it. So when we talk about biological approach, 
what it is. It's the model of explaining behavior caused by biological changes in chemical, structural, or genetic systems. This happens to be my favorite if we're being biased. <laughs> my sister has depression. She has major depression. She was diagnosed at age 15. She's been now, she's now 31. So what is that, 16 years? Look at that math. Am I the smartest person in the world? Yes. Okay, so she's been diagnosed with major depression for 16 years. I believe my sister's depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in her brain. My sister's body naturally does not produce enough serotonin. Because my sister does not have enough serotonin in her brain, without the medication she takes in Zoloft, her brain works at a deficit, which causes her depression. Okay? That is a chemical reaction. That is a biological approach. If you believe in the biological approach, schizophrenia is caused by too much serotonin because of a chemicals too much in your brain will cause other side effects. My sister has too little serotonin, causes depression. My, uh, I don't have any family members, but anyone who has schizophrenia, if you believe in the biological approach, you believe that brain has too much serotonin, which is why um, they have uh, schizophrenia, okay? So, biological approach believes it's a chemistry component that has caused the issue. Okay, psychoanalytic perspective. Psychoanalytic assumes that abnormal behavior stems from repressed conflicts. Who is this all about, ladies and gentlemen? Freud. So psychoanalytic. Psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, you can use it for both, yes. Okay, so they believe. So if I was talking to a psychoanalytic, psychodynamic about my sister who's been depressed she was 15 because I personally believe she has a lack of serotonin in her brain. They would say, my sister went through something as a child and that's presenting it as depression. Full heartedly? I think it depends. I think it depends. I think some cases there are definitely and I think overall yeah, for sure. No, ladies and gentlemen, you can have your own opinions about this. You can do whatever, you can think anything you want. I'm giving you the options. I'm telling you my personal opinion. I believe most of it's tied biological, but I do think that if someone goes through some terrible experience and they have repressed thoughts, it will present itself as depression, for sure. Absolutely. Jessica Simpson just released a book. By the way, I love Jessica Simpson, and Jessica Simpson is my husband's number one celebrity crush. Fun fact. No, he loves Beyonce, but it's Jessica Simpson. Daisy Duke, Jessica Simpson, if you need it to be more specific. <laughs> With that being said, Jessica Simpson said that she was sexually assaulted as a child, which presented itself as depression in her teens, which is why she turned to alcohol and drugs and stuff like that, which is why she sounds like an idiot, but she's apparently not an idiot, but that's up to you. With that being said, Psychoanalytic believe that it's all based on repressed thoughts. Then you have behaviorists. Behaviorists believe that the behavior that they're doing is learned. So my sister has learned, according to a behaviorist, that during her depressive, uh, during her depressive, what is the term when she's going through it? Huh? Episode, episode. episode, yeah, that's the word I want. During her depressive episodes, my sister has learned to do that behavior and has been reinforced positively by it by getting all of our attention, which is why she continues to do it every couple of years, go into a depressive state because it gives her the attention she wants. So, behaviorists say that my sister learned to act in this depressive manner by watching someone. If I had to say, if you believe in a behaviorist, which I'm not a huge behaviorist, I would say she learned it from my mother, because my mother goes through bouts of depression, depressive kind of state. She goes through ups and downs, just like everyone. Everyone in this room goes through ups and downs. Can we agree? It's completely normal. You're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be sad. And over most of the time, you're in the middle. That's, that's normal. Everyone, in, you know, that's the normal state. My mom kind of flirts with the kind of lower side. I don't think she's depressed, but I don't think she has it. But 
Uh, my mom is not a cheerful person, and I'm spending all weekend with her, so can't wait. With that being said, behaviors say, would say, my sister watched my mom's depressive-like behavior, has perfected it, and that's why my sister acts in a depressive way. What do we think? No. Why? So Marilyn Monroe's mother was schizophrenic. Her mother was schizophrenic and had numerous schizophrenic episodes while Marilyn Monroe was growing up, which is what Marilyn Monroe said caused all of her drinking and her drug abuse problems was because of watching her mother deal with all these psychotic behaviors and breakdowns, which is how she justified her behavior. Well, in fact... Um, she may have just had schizophrenia as well because it passes from generation to generation, just like your hair, your eye color, stuff like that. So is it because it was learned because she watched her mother and that's how she learned to cope with behaviors? Or is it because she actually had the disorder as well in a chemical way? I think it's interesting. I think we can agree there's sometimes people do learn behaviors and pick it up and use them. There you go. Guys, no one is right and no one is wrong. There is always an example that we can cite to that say, hey, well, this person clearly learned it from doing this, or this person clearly has a chemical background. But when you become a therapist, this is what you typically lean to. And I think we can all agree, they, all of these theories deserve to be heard, Yes. And then you can kind of choose which one do you personally think kind of works best. Especially for people in your own life that have these disorders. You may not have, know someone outright who has this disorder, but there are people in your lives who have these disorders whether you know them or not. Know it or not. So cognitive theorists, they see abnormal behaviors coming from irrational beliefs and illogical patterns of thought. So my sister thinks by acting depressed, she's going to gain more love. That math doesn't add up if you're, one, if you're thinking that. Well, how does that make any sense? It doesn't. That's what the cognitive psychologists believe, is that it's the evolution of illogical thinking patterns that causes changes of behavior. So schizophrenia by acting, um, by believing your Jesus, for instance, which is one of our four types of schizophrenia we'll be studying, uh, self-grandizing. Um, they believe that they're achieving more in their lives and giving their lives more of a purpose by believing that they're Jesus or that they're Elvis or whoever they're impersonating. I don't know. I don't know much about Kanye. I try not to listen to Kanye. All right, Kanye, we good? All right. Okay, so when we're talking about disorders, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't on your paper, just wait a second. When we're talking about disorders, you need to consider that each culture is a little bit differently, which means each culture deals with disorders a little bit differently. Here in the United States, our culture is way more confrontational than, say, let's say, Asian culture. However, Asian culture is much more... Uh, uh, is much more comfortable with accepting abnorm abnormalities than here in the United States. So when we talk about these disorders, you have to think about the cultural component. And then you also have cultural bound syndromes that are only found in certain places. So just keep aware of your cultural bias. Now, the DSM-4. It's the DSM-4. It is used to diagnose psychological disorders. You need to write that down. I put a big star next to it. It is used to diagnose psychological disorders. Okay. It is used by doctors and uh, clinicians and therapists. It is used by doctors, clinicians, and therapists. It has five axes. You need to write that down. It has five axes. What do you need?
Okay, it has five axes. In your application box, that's what I want you to write down. Axie one, and I'm going to tell you exactly what to write, so wait for me. Axie one. Okay? Are clinical disorders. Axie one are clinical disorders. Okay? Axie two is personality disorders and mental retardation. We'll come back to this. Okay. Axie three is your general medical conditions. Okay. Axie four is your psychosocial and environmental problems. And axie five is your global assessment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I do want to get started on anxiety disorders today, but we're going to come back to this tomorrow, and we're going to fill in that chart on your uh, focus. So right now we're kind of focusing on the study guide. Tomorrow we're going to fill in that chart on your focus, and we're going to go into much more detail. Is that fair? Okay, so right now we're really kind of focusing on the study guide. All right, everyone good? So there are how many axes are on the dsm 4 Five. Ladies and gentlemen, you do need to memorize the five axes. I'm so sorry to tell you. It will be on the AP exam, for sure. And it's on your test, but that's a whole other thing. Okay. So ladies and uh, <laughs> Ladies and doors, is that what I just said? Jeez. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let's begin our disorders. Our first group of disorders are going to be anxiety disorders. Okay, we'll deal with all that. So anxiety disorders are where we're going to start. By the way, anxiety disorders are the fastest growing type of disorders in the world. No, I wouldn't say at all. Um, I think, I will tell you right now, um, I graduated in 2005 from high school. I will tell you, your lives are harder than mine was in 2005. The amount of pressure that you guys have is insane, and I am not jealous. So enjoy your youth here, people. I'm glad my youth was in 05. Yes. Okay, so with that being said, the world has really changed. Even from 15 years ago when I graduated high school to where you guys are now, the times have changed so much, which is why we're seeing such a rise in anxiety. My generation was one of the first but you guys have way more anxiety than we do, so congrats. Well done. Well done. So, what type of, our, what are anxiety disorders? They are disorders in which the main symptom is excessive or unrealistic anxiety and fearfulness. Um, and that's going to see and um, present itself in many different ways. The first, when we talk about free-floating anxiety, is that on there somewhere? Okay. So, one type of anxiety is free-floating anxiety, which is anxiety that is unrelated to any realistic source or unknown. Okay? So, a type of anxiety disorder is called free-floating. So, you could just be sitting here and enjoying my lecture today and be like, yes, get it, Bennett. Look at this information, this knowledge. And you're like, yes, woo. And then all of a sudden, oh, my God, my whole family could die in a fire tonight. And you're just like, all of a sudden, like everything is fine, everything, nothing triggers. There's no stimulus, there's no terrible event, nothing has to happen. And then all of a sudden, you're covered in anxiety. It is a physical as well as emotional strain. It is not just like, oh, I'm sad. It is Every single person knows what it feels like to be absolutely terrified and absolutely stressed out. Imagine your worst, most stressed out self, and you're just sitting here having a nice day with your friends. You go out to a nice brunch, okay, and you're just sitting there, and then all of a sudden, it just hits you out of nowhere, and there's no warning, there's no trigger. It's just all of a sudden, 
your worst anxiety on your worst day is now just existing for no reason and no justification. How awful does that sound? Think of your worst day of anxiety, and that's what these people live with. And could you imagine the anxiety of getting the anxiety? Being unable to predict, to plan, or to compensate for that anxiety, knowing that it could happen at any moment. Wouldn't that stress you out even more? And wouldn't that make it trigger probably more? Yes. That's the problem with free-floating anxiety. It can just come out of nowhere, and it can be triggered by anything. And it is the, it's is—it's not like, oh, man, I'm stressed. It is, I'm shutting down. I cannot experience anything else. Like, that shit can't imagine. We also have phobias. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are things you don't like. Like, my husband hates snakes. Okay. He does not have a phobia of snakes. There is a difference between having a fear and not liking something and a phobia. A phobia means every moment of your day is dedicated to the avoiding of whatever you fear. So say, for instance, my husband had a fear of snakes. My husband, every single night, would take duct tape and put duct tape underneath the door of the bedroom to make sure a snake doesn't get in. Now, we live in a seven-story, like, building, so, like, that would be some crazy shit if a snake got in, but that's a whole other thing. He would tape duct tape underneath the door so a snake couldn't come in. Every single night, he'd be on his hands and knees looking for snakes underneath the bed and in the closet. Every single night, he would be vacuuming perfectly to make sure that there is no component to it. Every single night, he would be setting traps for snakes in our seven-story condo building, okay? Every single aspect of his life would be dedicated to the, avoid of the avoiding of snakes. Now, my husband hates snakes. When he sees them, he's terrified and runs across the street or runs away from it wherever he is. Doesn't matter, okay? My husband does not live in constant perpetual fear of snakes. Do we see the difference? Okay. There's a woman in England who has a fear of left turns. She won't take a left turn in her car. So what she does is that she plans out with a map every single day how to get where she needs to go so she doesn't have to take a left-hand turn. So she will sit at her kitchen table and plan for 45 minutes of how to get to the grocery store that would be like two lefts and a right from her house that'll now take her a half an hour, 45 minutes to get to because she won't take a left. That's a phobia. A phobia is when you go out of your way every single day constantly to avoid something. It is not, oh man, I, you know, uh, snakes, eh, spiders, eh. If you vacuum your closet every single day in your shoes and your house to make sure that there are no spiders and you cannot sleep unless you tape underneath your door and around the frame of your bedroom door to make sure no spiders get in, you do not have a phobia of spiders. <laughs> huh? There's some, we've got plenty of other issues, but uh, it's not a phobia. Do we understand the difference between a fear and a phobia? Okay. However, you can't have social phobia. Now, I do not generally have social phobia. Am I a social person? No. Am I antisocial? Yes. However, I did go out to dinner with a girlfriend last night, so I'm so proud. What? I know, on a school night, it's a rarity. It's a lot of work to go out on a school night. It's exhausting. Anyway. So, social phobia. <laughs> Is a fear of interacting with others or being in social situations that might lead to negative evaluations. So these are people who do not go out in public. These are people who have created a whole life online. Who do not leave their house because they fear interacting with others. I have a fear of social situations. I do not have a social phobia. Here I am. Look at me, speaking to you people. How lucky are you? If I had a true social phobia, I would have never left my house this morning. 
I would not have gone to the dog park. I would not have been able to interact. All my groceries would be delivered to my house. Okay. Um, everything would be done via technology. Okay. All of those different types of components in order to limit the amount of interaction I have. So you have to go well out of your way every moment of every day in order to achieve a phobia. What do you got? Good example. Social phobia. No hairspray? Yes. Her mom. Her mom, absolutely. That's good, right? Yeah, but I mean, the fact that she gets over it pretty quickly okay. is kind of weird. Side, what about shameless? Oh, I've never seen shameless, so I can't. Years. I can't. Oh, yeah. 15 years is a long time. That's a long time. 15 years in the house. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Hairspray. Yeah, I can't think of it. Hairspray. Hairspray. So, drive like that. Yeah, that is. They still haven't been able to have the house in years. Moving forward, we have specific phobias. So specific phobias, you're fine, are fear of objects or specific situations or events. For instance, arachnophobia is a specific phobia. Um, what are some other phobias people have? Claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is in closed spaces. Okay, so fear of being in small enclosed spaces. And then we have arachnophobia, which is a fear of heights. And then agoraphobia, which is on your study guide, by the way. Agoraphobia is a fear of being in a place or situation which di uh, escape is difficult or impossible. Huh? No, you just need to know agoraphobia. How much time do I have, Margo? Okay, so agoraphobia is a, a fear of being in a place or situation in which escape is difficult or impossible. Um, it's a fear of like open spaces where you can't escape. Like if you're in a large field, how hard is it to get out of the middle of a large field? Like you have to really commit to it, stuff like that. Yeah. What do you got, Annie? Um, is it a phobia though? I know, but is it a real phobia? As long as it's kind of consistent, she may have, like, I don't know who this person is. Like, people are like, oh my god, I have, a, I have, like, arachnophobia. I hate spiders. Like, no, you hate spiders. You don't have arachnophobia. If she, that person goes out of their way every single day to avoid small holes, is that what you were trying to tell me? Is that what her fear is? Yeah, and it's going to trigger a reaction, then yeah. Uh, like a visceral reaction, then yes, that would be a phobia. Like people who skip but, I mean, I just I don't know who this trick is, so like it would have to be consistent that they're going out of their way all the time to avoid it. So it has to be both. What do you mean both? But then why wouldn't she be trying to avoid it so she doesn't have that visceral reaction? She doesn't do anything, but, like, if somebody is like, oh, there's this, she's like, no, no, 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 she's like, no,
You know what I mean? So I don't know what's going on there. And I'm not a doctor either. But, I mean, I would be a little skeptic. I got the news. Um, Jessica, uh, I have a student who sits there. Can you sit back in the back? Annie, sorry, I just needed uh, What were you going to say? Um, well, to continue. Uh, um, I had a, well, I had a friend and he was...